The Expansion Zone with Sonia Barrett. Everybody's talking about consciousness. Everybody wants that eternal kiss. Yeah, everyone's saying there's more than this. Everyone wants to follow their own bliss. Talking about one love, one blood, one love. On the Expansion Zone, we examine life and our quest to understand who and what we are and of the vastness of human potentials. We explore the making of our world from quantum physics to parapsychology, health, sociology and philosophy, along with practical living. You are reminded of the possibilities in creating personal change. So for an hour, we'll stimulate and expand the mind. Welcome once again to another edition of the Expansion Zone with Sonia Barrett. I'm, of course, Sonia Barrett, your host. Thank you for tuning in on this Monday. And of course, I'd like you to keep in mind, or at least know that where you are right now in your life has purpose and reason. And the key, however, is to be open to seeing what this moment in time is saying to you. It's all stepping stones, and sometimes we forget that. And uh, hopefully we allow ourselves to come away with greater levels of enlightenment or, or just being aware. So today's topic is going to be about discovering culture codes and the hidden forces behind behaviors. My guest is going to be Dr. Clotia Rapai, author of The Culture Code, An Ingenious Way to Understand Why People Around the World Live and Buy as They Do. So basically the fact is that we go about our lives inundated by marketing and you know we all admit that and some of us have the sense that we're being manipulated but the question is are we really being manipulated and just a, a little quote i took from dr rapai's site that says um you are successful because you are on code the reptilian is what you should appeal to if you want to sell successfully and of course um, these are uh, perfect is perfect for people who are in in any sort of business and of course this spills over into just life in general so brief bio here dr g clotier rapai is an internationally known expert in archetype discoveries and creativity his unique approach to marketing combines a psychiatrist's depth of analysis with a businessman's attention to practical concerns he has written more than 17 books on these topics. Two of those books are Creative Communication, now used as a standard reference for the French advertising industry and the culture code. Uh, Dr. Rapai's technique for marketing research has grown out of his work in the areas of psychiatry, psychology, and cultural anthropology. His work is an extension of the work done by many of the great scholars of the 20th century, including Young, uh, Lang, Levi Strauss, and Ruth Benedict. Uh, anyway, so uh, without further ado, because I really want to get into all that Dr. Kotia Rapai um, has to say, I'd like to welcome him to the show. Welcome, Dr. Rapai, to the Expansion Zone. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you again. Yes, the first time I interviewed you, I think, was actually back in maybe 2008 or something like that. And the, the, what was wow. one? Yeah, yes. <laughs> the, the beauty is that the, the way I found out about you was actually my son. Um, you know, for being, well, young, he was watching something on PBS. And he says, you've got to watch this, Mom. You've got to watch this. And 
then you know we we did ultimately get the book the culture code and it was so fascinating to understand all of this information and of course dr repai is also in my documentary um the business of disease so where do we begin i think that we should probably begin by you maybe explaining a bit about this idea of um imprints because people mention this they talk about it but we don't really you know necessarily always have a clear understanding of what we're talking about maybe imprints and then we go further into um as a as a culture or society and how this spills over yeah as you say the the, the notion of the imprint or imprinting is absolutely crucial uh, to understand uh, how we function in, in everything we do uh, it could be uh, love it could be buying it could be sex it could be power it could be fighting to protect the environment i mean we uh, we are puppets but we don't know who are the, who is the puppeteer who is pulling the strings and i do believe that the first imprint we have of anything uh really create a mental structure that becomes unconscious and we're not aware of it but we keep using this uh, reference system that has been imprinted most of the time at an early age uh without being aware of it so i think discovering what is this imprint how this imprint has been performed in uh, our mind uh what kind of emotion has been used to create this imprint uh, is very very powerful it, it, it's a, you know my, my philosophy is a uh, freedom through awareness uh, which means that if we become aware uh, we might be more uh, conscious and and more uh, uh, responsible and more able to act in the appropriate way uh, so that's what i dedicate my life to to discover this first uh, imprint well and you know it's interesting just taking a step back uh, i'm just going to ask you was there a particular point in really in your life where this awareness or this questioning or this observation i think of people as a whole and as a society was there a particular point that you can think of maybe even as a child where this curiosity oh, yeah. led you in this direction yeah yeah you see the 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 the, the first thing that happened in my life was uh, I, i was born during the war and um you know i, I was a uh, 3 year old when the uh, d day happened and the american uh, liberated france so and and uh, i i really remember my first imprint of course i remember with all the filter that what my parents told me and what i read about it and everything but i still have this imprint in my mind of the the first time the german were running away and, and so uh, i was born in uh, france occupied by the german and for me the german was were in charge Uh, they were the powerful guy with the boots and the guns and and uh, uh, and everybody was following their order uh, and suddenly one day i saw these big guys running away uh, throwing their helmet and guns on the side of the road stealing bicycle and running away and so that was my first imprint that wow the world is different today what is going on how come things have changed suddenly and then the next thing that happened was Uh, a big monster coming out of the forest you know ah, da, 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 da. there was an american tank with a white star and still today i remember the smell and the sound and the you know the the, the everything that was con connected with this moment i remember that very vividly that was my first imprint of american and mm. you know i they 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 look at me uh, big guys with a helmet with a net on the helmet and some flowers in the in the helmet and and they were looking at me and they put me on the tank uh, gave me chocolate and chewing gum and took me for a ride how can you beat that how can you forget you see, that <laughs> I, you cannot for you so you know they, they, i was not the only one the only kid they done that too by the way many, many of my friends had the same experience but you know after a while they had to go because they had other things to do and you know i was waving goodbye to them um because they had to go and i say well one day i'm going to be on this tank you know for obvious reason i didn't want to be french they were losers i didn't want to be a german for obvious reason i wanted to become an american 
And that has been imprinted. I was like three or four years old. I mean, this is just amazing. All my life, that I was already an American. My imprint was so strong that, you know, that, that, that's it. Today, I'm, I'm very proud to be an American. And, you know, and, and that, that's it. That's my destiny. So, but that has been imprinted at a very early age, you see. So, and this is the same structure that happened for a lot of things. You know, what means love, what means work, what means protecting the environment. All this has been imprinted without us being very conscious of it. But this is this is a mental structure that exists that is activated all the time we think about that. And that's what I think is fascinating to discover that because, you know, that it's amazing. You know, I've, I've done a lot of work in China recently and to discover the first imprint of what it means to be Chinese um, helped to explain everything that they're doing today. You know, the relationship between China and Hong Kong can only be understood if you understand the first imprint of what it means for in mainland China to be Chinese. The same with the French. You know, the French are always on strike. Okay, well, why? Because of the first imprint of what it means to be French. The, the Brexit, uh, the, the, the English want to, want to leave. Of course they want to leave. They've never been part of it anyway. So, you know, so again, this is what is the first imprint of uh, being, be, being English or be, being British, which is a little different. So all, all that is fascinating because we, we're not aware of that. You see, I, I believe that the first imprint you have of what means love, it, it, it's very crucial to, uh, to, to, to organize, to prepare, to, pre, to uh, uh, structure uh, all your uh, uh, emotional life. You know, it's absolutely, uh, you know, let, let me just give you an example. I mean, I, I did some research in, uh, with a professor that was an expert in uh, uh, Eskimo country. Eskimo, you know, the north, this right. tribe living in, in the North Pole. And he told me that in, in, in one of the tribes he studied, that was like, you know, 60 years ago. Huh? So uh, I don't know if they still exist today. But he said in that tribe at the time, uh, the, the, when the mother had a daughter, she will tell her daughter. My, my, my darling, let me tell you what is love. Love is when you are in love, fall in love deeply with three men at the same time. <laughs> okay, if you don't fall in love with three men, if it's only one man, shame on you. You're not my daughter anymore. I don't want to see you. This is terrible. But three men is okay. Five men is even better. That's real love. All right? So... What, that, what is that? Well, the, the survival dimension, the reptilian dimension in that tribe is uh, a lot of women die delivering babies. So there are not too many women around, first. Uh, second, when you uh, get married and you get pregnant, you cannot survive if you have only one man uh, doing the work around you. Uh, you, you, need, you need at least three men to survive. One go fishing, one build the igloo, one the other one uh, go collecting some wood. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of work to, for this woman to survive. And so uh, that's why the, the, the tradition is that you get married. Uh, 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 this is uh, polyandria. You get married with three men. No problem. Well, no problem. By the way, they, they have, according to my, the professor, they had very interesting practices because, you know, so most of the time they're very respectful when they have an intimate relationship with the woman. Uh, the other guys stay outside. Now, outside in the North Pole, wow, it's freezing. <laughs> Talk about respect. And so, and, and so the, you know, the, the nice guy, the guy that goes quickly, <laughs> so that, that's a... <laughs> They had to go fast because the other guys are freezing outside. I think I don't know if it was a joke, but I, I like this story anyway. So <laughs> you see, so so the, the the notion that today we say no, no, you you should be in love with only one person. Okay, fine. It depends in which tribe you were born into, and how was your first imprint. You see, and so the, the, this is what is fascinating because uh, you, you, you know, for example, in 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 France for many many centuries, uh, uh, marriage was nothing to do with love. Marriage was an agreement between two families, uh, sometimes two noble families. You know, uh, children were married when they were five or six years old because that was a way to get an alliance between uh, the French and the Spaniard or the French and the Australian and so on. So, uh, uh, so uh, love was something else. You had mistresses or lovers. Uh, you know, the, the king had like three, 15 different uh, lovers. I mean, 
there was nothing wrong with that. And, and uh, you know, having an affair would never end up a, a marriage because the purpose of the marriage was something else. It was not love. It was, not, uh, yeah. it was more like, a, absolutely, it was more than an agreement uh, between two families and sometimes to try to avoid wars between one country to another for the, for the nobility and so on. So uh, this is re relatively new in the history of, of uh, 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 mankind, uh, th that we want to have something that we call love in, in a unique relationship between a man and, and, and a woman. This is very, very new. Uh, and, but today, nobody will, will argue with that, that this is supposed to be, uh, or, or at least for some people, the, the reference system here. So this is, this is what is so fascinating to see that, you know, education, for example, uh, how do we relate to our children, right? Um, in, in many, for, for centuries, uh, as children uh, were not really taken care of. They will have, they will just go with the father or the mother, do the work, learn by copying them, and then uh, that's it, you know. Uh, but soon, uh, very, very, uh, not soon, but recently, uh, I would say in the past uh, century or two centuries, we start looking at children as uh, a special being. We have to take care of them. Uh, you know, looking today, uh, the fact that children saying, Mom, <clears throat> I'm bored. Uh, so, I mean, this would be completely nonsense <clears throat> for thousands of years. You know, but no, today we feel parents feel like their responsibility to entertain their children all the time. I mean, oh, interesting. Again, this is something we don't question today. Uh, but you see, the, 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 the parents are becoming like, uh, like, like servants or butlers. Or, uh, uh, and, uh, okay, and they feel guilty if they don't do that the, the, the right way. Um, but it's interesting. You. But this is, it's interesting, though, uh, in terms of what happens to create that kind of, I'm not sure if I can call it devolution or evolution or whatever, but to, to, <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. to, to bring about that kind of behavior because something is happening. There's a journey that is leading up to what a society becomes in, in that yeah, particular yeah. moment. So yeah. that I find it. This is a fascinating question because, you know, uh, uh, we can question progress. Uh, is, is there any progress in the way we are we evolve? You know, uh, we can question uh, the interaction uh, between the economy, uh, uh, safety, security, and so on. Um, th this is fascinating. But the reality is that, uh, you know, if you look at the French culture, and uh, of course, because I was born in France, I've done a lot of research on uh, the, the French culture code, if you want. Uh, the French are very unhappy. They're very unhappy. Uh, they, they are the one that use, uh, because I always check with numbers when I want to check something. So they, they are more Prozac sold in France than anywhere else in the world. They use, they, they, they use all the kind of drugs to try to compensate their depression. There are more depression there. Uh, they, 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 uh, you know, we, we question how many policemen killed themselves in New York City recently. And, and I look at the number, it was like uh, last year, like three or four policemen commit suicide. Uh, 85 policemen in France commit suicide with a population that is only eight, uh, 70 million or something like that versus 333 million in, in America. So uh, they're depressed. Depression, you know, why, why is that? Why is that? Because at a certain time in the 18th century, the imprint of la douceur de vivre, the beautiful life, the sweetness of life, was, uh, was such an extravagant, uh, uh, ex you know, sophisticated way of behaving um, that today they have the nostalgia of that douceur de vivre. Today they, 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 they know uh, what is perfection and they cannot attain it. So they always argue and criticize and hate themselves and hate each other and hate every, the whole world uh, because they know how that should be and this is not the way it should be. And so th that's what makes these people, the French people, uh, we know I, 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 have a, I love the French culture, of course, but the French people today, uh, they are in the streets every day. They are on strike. They're complaining about everything. And, but if you look at France, it's a beautiful place. The food is excellent. The women are beautiful. I mean, this is nice climate. I mean, they should be happy. No, 
they cannot be happy because the, the imprint they have is that they, they are supposed to be the most sophisticated people in the world that created even the world, the word etiquette and, and you know, and, and, and they cannot do it anymore. And so, you know, it, it, when there is no expectation, uh, there is no frustration. But when you have a very high expectation, uh, it's very difficult to uh, satisfy your expectation. And so then you, 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 there, there is, the result is uh, uh, you're not satisfied and there is depression. That's why the French always complain about everything. <laughs> Interesting. And a lot of this just seems like it just comes down to um, survival. All of our yeah. um, behaviors yeah. come down to that. And, you know, there's so many questions that I, I would love to ask you. And so... Let's hope we can make enough, have enough time for that. But looking at these imprints, now we live in a time where there's such a, you know, racial uprising. This has always been, but particularly in the Western world or in the, in the United States, there is now this, um, this huge racial, uh, what should I call it? Focus, uh, divide. There's just so much going on uh, in that area. What what can you say in terms of this this racial imprint that perhaps exists maybe uniquely here? I mean, it's not just here, but is there any light that you can shed on where we're coming from? Why this just continues? It, it's not. It doesn't go away. Well, you see that the, first of all, the, this is the cultural cultural definition. Uh, cultural definition, because you know that uh, a, a race, uh, a pure race, doesn't exist. Uh, biologically, we all mixed of you know many many different races. So a pure race doesn't exist. You see, I, I, I've seen some people in America, some women on television. Um, you know, the, the, that was I didn't see anything special. They were just fine. They you know uh, blonde, uh, blue eyes, and and uh, you know white skin and so on. And then after a while, these women say, uh, but as you know, I'm black. Say, what? <laughs> yeah, as you know, I'm black. Okay, so oh, well, why not? If you want to be black, I'm fine. But you know, for me, that was not my first impression. So, you know, the, the, at a certain time, it, it's, a, it's a choice that you make sometime to decide that you belong to this race or this group of people or, or not. I mean, some people, you know, uh, there is no question that they come in. But if, if you look at uh, India, I've done a lot of work in India. In the south part of India, uh, people have very, very dark skin, very dark skin, all right? So, but of course, they're not African-American, they are Indians, right? So how do you, if, they, if these people arrive in America, how do you treat them? Are they black? Are they African-American? No, they're not African-American. Oh, okay, okay. So it, it becomes very complicated because uh, it, it's somewhere, it's the way the culture, for example, I remember the first time when I became an American many, many decades ago, and, and I had to fill up a form, and, and you know, they, they, they say, uh, are you Hispanic or Caucasian? What? Yeah, there is a difference between being Hispanic or being Caucasian, all right? So this is the mental category that comes from the American culture. Now, for me, uh, the, the king of Spain today uh, is from French origin, is a Bourbon. He comes from the same uh, lineage as Louis XIV and Louis XV. So uh, he, he is Hispanic, but he's not another race that, the French or, you know, the, the, the Spaniard occupied Italy for a long time. And so there is this mix of, uh, so for me, this notion that there is a difference between Caucasian and Hispanic, well, that's already kind of, of an interesting uh, uh, mental shock for me at the beginning. And so I said, okay, well, these people are different. But for me, in my mind, they were not separated, you see, because of my first imprint that I had uh, in, 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 in France. So the notion of race is somewhere... Uh, 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 something that is used for political uh, um, benefit, if you want. And so, uh, uh, for example, in India, again, uh, you, you have uh, people that uh, um, uh, revendicate the, the, the fact that they belong to a, a, a low, lower caste, lower caste, very low, the, the bottom. Uh, why? Because they have benefit. The government gives them advantages. So pe people want to be part of this lower caste. They want this identity, you know. So uh, again, it, it's um, it, it's more complicated. But in our mind, 
uh, w- what we have is that we have this imprint. Uh, I, I remember reading about uh, Louisiana and, and, and New Orleans um, in the uh, 18th century and so on. And so the, the, with a lot of French influence, uh, as you know there. And I remember reading a, a book about Chignon. Chignon is a way you, you, you put your hair, a woman put her hair in a little, uh, like a, together on top of your, of your uh, head, head, you put your hair together, okay? And so a Chignon, uh, uh, there, there were a bit controversy about Chignon at the time. Why? Because um, it, it was fashionable at the time when you were a, a rich man uh, to have a, a, a mistress. And, and, and the mistress was presented to you by the mother of the mistress. Uh, and the mother will tell you, if you want to take my daughter as a mistress, uh, you have to give her a, a carriage with at least six horses. Uh, she needs to have three uh, uh, butlers. She needs to have a maid. She needs, otherwise, you know, I will not let her become your mistress. Okay, so it was like official mistresses. Uh, the wives knew about that, and that was okay. As long as uh, the... the uh, the only the wife could have a chignon, which means oh. a way to arrange your hair. Wow. But suddenly, at a certain time, the revendication from this mistress's woman was they want to have a chignon too. You see, and so then the the, the battle was about the way you arrange your hair. It was not so much about uh, being married or having a mistress. And so, so it, it, it's and then this mistress is the most beautiful one. Uh, were always mixed races. I mean, they, they will tell you, uh, uh, read the document of the time, they say, oh, you know, a, a little bit of black blood creates such a charm and a beauty. And uh, so, again, you know, biologically, if we want to, to be scientists for a minute, I mean, uh, the hybrids, people have more chance to survive than the pure race. Pure race is a nonsense. It's a nonsense in terms of, of survival and reptilian. Uh, the more you mix races, the better you, sense you have to adapt to all the different situations and to survive. So the reptilian is for mixed races, but the culture, uh, the dominance, the, the power that uh, one caste or one group or one race want to have of the others uh, uh, might go against the reptilian. Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is really, um, what should I say, enlightening in the sense of the scientific part of it, because I think we get caught up in the emotions of, um, yeah, yeah. of you know, of, of this kind of thinking, as opposed to uh, the science behind uh, all of this. And, yeah. and at the end of the day, everything has some scientific value um, to it. You know, it's, yeah, it's how yeah. everything exists. But also, let's, let's also look at um, the corporate... But, but if, if I may... Go ahead. If I may add something here, because mm-hmm. I think that you touch in something that is really important for me at, at that point, you know, uh, I, I really believe, and I, I practice psychotherapy, psychoanalysis. I had to cure children for a long time, and then their family and everything. I really believe that everyone is unique, and you you are unique as a person, uh, who you are, and you're not defined only by your race or your gender or your age or your look. Uh, you, you, you are a lot more than that. You, you, your identity transcend all that in a mixed, and 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 everything keeps changing. Your look keeps changing when you get older, and things. So, but to think about you being your identity being being reduced to one label, I think is is very dangerous and uh, very uh, detrimental to your personal evolution. But to look at who you are personally. You know, when when people ask me, uh, "Oh, who are you?" I say, "I wish I knew," <laughs> <laughs> I, because I, I'm still in 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 I'm still creating myself every day, and uh, and sometimes I completely disagree with myself. You know, so I say when people say I disagree with you, I say good because I disagree with myself too most of the time. You see, it, it, it's it's a more complex things. It's an evolution, uh, and I think the big mistake we have today is to label people. Uh, in terms of race or gender or age or, uh, it, you know, people are, are unique. And, and uh, when I meet somebody, I want to see the uniqueness of this person, not not the, the labels. Right. Now, I understand um, 
in particular about um, when somebody wants, because we're, we're conditioned to categorize people. So we want them to identify, well, what do you do or who are you? We, we, we are comfortable with some sort of yeah, final yeah. identification and analysis. And for me, I used yeah, to yeah. joke when people say, what do you do? And I go, what do you, you mean now, like right now? Because I don't know. Next week, I may <laughs> decide to yeah. do something else. But right now, th this is what I do. And I, you know, so I'm very aware of the sense of I'm, I'm, I'm playing a character. I'm, I'm playing a role. And that role changes. Um, I, I'm allowing yeah, yeah. it to, to change and to evolve my experiences. And our yeah, society yeah, yeah. likes a one-dimensional thing. Like, oh, you should only do one thing. So there is there there is that, and people struggle with that. So um, let's let's with saying all of that, you know what we do? Let's stop and take a quick break. So we're going to take a very very short break, and we will be right back after this brief message. Hello, everyone. This is Vanessa Valdez, host of Transforming Consciousness every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on KPFK. Join me each week as we learn from each other ways to awaken our consciousness for the greater good of all. That's Transforming Consciousness with me, Vanessa Valdez, every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on KPFK. Stay tuned. Okay, and we are back and we are coming to you from KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles. And uh, you're listening to the Expansion Zone with Sonia Barrett. And of course, that's me, your host. And I'm speaking with my guest, Dr. Clotier Rapai. Um, he's the author of 17 books. But of course, his, his book that I am you know, that really got me familiar with him is the culture code. And we're having a very profound conversation uh, about culture and uh, imprints and codes. So now I'd like to take a look at um, the, the, the marketing aspect, because we have the sense that, okay, well, we're being manipulated. But, you know, according to your work, I asked the question, well, are we, which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, in terms yeah, of... Yeah branding yeah. and and what we think we want or what we need are we told what we should want yeah, you, know? yeah. you see uh, my position is very clear on this respect uh, there, there are people that do uh, good marketing and people that do bad marketing the one that do bad marketing they fail and they're going to disappear what is bad marketing to try to force people to buy something they don't need so they might buy it once and then they don't buy it anymore what, what, what is good marketing? And what, this is what I, I do, of course, is, is to try to discover the uh, unaddressed, unconscious, uh, uh, you know, and, and unexpressed needs of the people. What are the real needs that they have? Uh, you know, they, they, what are the, 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 the unconscious needs, uh, unexpressed, unaddressed needs? And so you cannot ask them. That's why I, do, I usually say I don't believe what people say because people don't know. What is unconscious? They're not, they're not conscious, so they cannot tell you. Huh? But when you discover these unconscious needs and then you address them, of course you're successful because these people say, of course, of course, this is what I wanted. There's no, no question, you see. So that's what we need to, to, to discover here, you see. Uh, for me, there is, there is an old uh, uh, field, uh, world, universe that is opening up now. Uh, uh, it's it because of the fact that we're going to live longer. You see, a, a woman that is 50 today might be in the middle of her life. She still might have 50 years. I mean, I have many friends that are 97, 90, one is 104. I mean, this is amazing, amazing. So uh, what, is, what, is, what are the needs <clears throat> when, as a woman, uh, you don't have the, the, the biological clock that, that is ruling your life anymore? Like, you, you know, uh, so... You, you're free from biology in some ways, in some ways, and, and then what, what is life now? What are your needs? What do you want? You see, and that is unknown. Why? Because most of the research in the past and was done by men, and so they didn't care. And, and second, for century, women will have children, children, children dead. Uh, no, it's not even time for menopause. So, so, but now this is different. This is very different. You see, and so this, this uh, uh, 
new matriarcha, if you want, because these women usually live longer than men. This is, again, in medical biology here. And so um, what are their needs? What are the real needs they have? And uh, I, I disagree with all the traditional marketing that they just want to look like they are 18-year-old. Or, I, I don't think this is that simple. I think there is there is a, a need to be bien dans sa peau, to feel good in your own skin, to be able to uh, express and materialize and discover things that you never did before. And, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So, uh, I, I, you know, the, the reality of, uh, is like you have a line, which is your age. Uh, uh, your age goes from zero to maybe 100. So it's a straight line going from zero to 100. But you have your biological age. And now we say, oh no, 70 is a new 50, which is as a biological reality. How a body now, when you, you are 70, is a body of a 50-year-old person. <laughs> but there is a psychological dimension. And, and in America, we are permanent teenagers. We know that. Huh? So it, it, we are, it's an adolescent culture. So uh, when, when we are adolescent, adolescent, we do all the crazy things we do. And then at a certain time, we're supposed to behave like an adult, which we don't really, we don't really do. Uh, but at a certain time, you know, I've been working recently on, on retirement homes. Um, people will tell me when, you know, they are 65, 70, say, you know, look, I have, I, I, I have my, uh, 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 my allowance on a regular time. Uh, I don't need to work. Uh, I have my car. I can go where I want. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, I want to go on a cruise and not do anything. And they, they are, they, they, I call that teenagers, which they are uh, uh, senior teenagers. They, they're going back to being teenagers. And when we did some work in, in, in a retirement home in, uh, in uh, uh, New Mexico and, and um, Arizona, these people, <clears throat> they had sex all the time. You know, I was doing some work for Durex, a condom, and, uh, and, and they had the resurgence of uh, sexually transmitted disease among the people that are 70, 80, and 90. Wow. We have a hard time in our mind to see our grandmother having sex. This is something that you have a hard time to accept that. But we have to understand that now this is not the same notion. Age is not the same. And so I remember speaking with men, asking them why they don't use condom. And they say, well, I'm going to die anyway, so why should I bother? Wow, you see, this is incredible. They, 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 they think they are in some way like teenagers. Um, they don't care about death anymore. This is like the teenagers are invincible, but these teenagers have a way to look at, they, go, they went beyond death already. So it's amazing. It's amazing. So uh, how to convince them? Because, you know, for example, part of my job was to convince uh, uh, the, these uh, senior people uh, to use condom. And, and, and if you don't understand the, the imprint about uh, what they have about this age, this new age, you know, what, what, what they want is to be on a cruise all the time. They want to be on a cruise all the time. They, 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 they want to have a free uh, uh, booze, a free drinks, a, free, a lot of food, uh, of parties every night. They don't want to be responsible. They don't want to have any children. I don't know if you remember uh, uh, Everybody Loves Women. Right. Uh, that was a series on television. And, and the mother, at a certain time, uh, say to Raymond, uh, I want to go on a cruise. Okay, mother, I will buy you a cruise, and, but I don't want your father to come. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so they just go together on the cruise, so the son and, and the mother. And then he is in the, ca- in the cabin waiting for, for the mother at 2 o'clock in the morning, and she arrives, and he says, oh, mother, is late. Are you going to go to bed? No, no, I'm going back to party with my friends. What? It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> and then he discovered that she told a friend that, that she was a widow. And she, she drinks all the time, and she party and she dance, and she, you know, th- this is what they want. This is what they want, and it, it's amazing. You see, so that's one way we tell come to this uh, uh, retirement home because there is good doctors, and they don't care. Tell them you have free drinks. Oh, yeah, you have cocktail hour. Oh, that, that's a lot better. All the food you want. Oh, <laughs> so it, it, it's it's quite fascinating to see that we we have a rational logical way to look at this category of the population which is going to increase around the world this is big 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 market if you want and and marketers today st- 
still thinking about they have to sell to millennials. Right. Millennials yeah, don't want to buy right. mm-hmm. They don't want to buy anything. They don't even want to buy a car. They want to buy a house. And so, but this is the population. These people over 55, 65, they, they in good health. Uh, they are. They have a lot of money, and they want to enjoy life. This is the, 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 the big market that everybody will be, should be looking at. Look what is happening in Japan. Japan is incredible. They, they, they have a, a place, Okinawa, where, where the, the, the people live over 110. I mean, right. it is, and this is this amazing. Is, yeah, and I think this is precisely, you know, a lot of my points <coughs> that, that I tend to talk about because um, here, though, we do see it on American TV a lot of push for reminding people that they're supposed to either be sick by a certain age or there there's a lot of that that still goes on and there are people that that do buy into it they do expect um you know a certain level of decline and and i talk about uh this gentleman that i interviewed years back for the film um at 111 and the thing that stuck with me, I mean, because he was very functional, he was walk, walking like under two miles a day, and he was uh, still writing, you know, planning to write a second book. I mean, he was very active. And he said to me, he said, the only thing that you should focus on is living. He, he says, don't even yeah. worry about dying, just focus on living. Uh, and that is, <laughs> yeah, you of know, and he, yeah, he died, on, he was 114. Um, but he, but he just slept away. His his daughter said he got up and did the same things, and so he didn't die of anything other than he just one day he just didn't wake up. Um, but be- <laughs> before we do run out of time, I still want to get the audience to get a better understanding of how these codes are are you know retrieved to understand. And there was one in your book where you talked about. Um, toilet paper as this first imprint and just to get people to have this better understanding as to how these these first imprint codes are being made available yeah, yeah. to companies you know that hire you when they yeah you see, yeah, you, see you, you you mentioned toilet paper and, and that was for charming charming the toilet paper so I remember that was one of my first uh, job at PNG uh, and by the way, we've done 25 codes for them. So obviously they like the first one that they did for them because otherwise they will not, not ever ask for more. So, but when we, they, they told me, okay, you know, toilet paper is a big business because people use usually toilet paper several times a day. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, we did some research, traditional focus group. And we know, we know that American people, they just want that to be soft and on sales. That's it. That's how they buy toilet paper. And I say, okay, uh, let me try to go back to the first imprint. What do you mean first imprint? Yeah, your first imprint of toilet paper. What that? What do you mean toilet paper? So I had a hard time to convince them at the beginning. But, you know, it's clear that you go to a focus group with 12 strangers, and they ask you, uh, tell me about how you use toilet paper. Wow. It's not great subject of conversation, so you're not going to get much out of these people uh, around the table, you know, telling you. But what I do is I take people back to the, when they were children. So uh, it, it's a three-hour process uh, where we take them uh, from the, the, the cortex, uh, where we liberate all the uh, cliché and stereotypes. Then the second hour, we go into emotions. And the third hour, they lie down on the floor. I know it's crazy, but they lie down on the floor, and uh, we take them in a relaxation uh, process. Uh, we take a train going back in time, and they go back to when they were children. I can tell you, uh, I've done a lot of work for Boeing, uh, a, a group of engineers, of course. And when I told them, uh, if you want to understand uh, what you feel about an airplane, uh, we have to take them back to their first imprint, and they have to lie down on the floor. Lie down on the floor? Mm-hmm. Wow. So that was not easy to convince Boeing to do that. But we have done 15 codes for them since then. So obviously they love the results. So we take people back to the first time uh, you go to, uh, you're going to use toilet paper. So first of all, you know, I, 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 one of my uh, boy was born in America. So I went, I went through that process with him. So usually um, mothers, sometimes the father, um, try to toilet train the baby or the, the, young, the young human being. And so the the um, you know there are books about toilet training, 
Um, by the way, some are, are blue, some are pink, because they're saying that there's different training from boys and girls, which is not really true, but anyway. And, uh, and, and at a certain time, uh, you think uh, the child is totally trained. It's very important because if you're not totally trained, you cannot go to summer camp. So you better be totally trained. But when you think the child is totally trained, uh, you, your parents, the parents, are still need to go and check and sometimes to finish the job because they might be totally trained, but they're not, not really trained. So, but one day they are totally paper trained and there is no book to explain how, what means totally paper trained. And the, the symbol of being totally paper trained is when they can close the door and lock the door and say, mommy, stay out. And at that moment, the emotion is mommy say, oh, bravo, fantastic, I'm so happy. So think about the logic of emotion here, the logic of emotion. It's emotional, but there is a logic behind it. You reject your mother or your father. You say, stay out, you lock the door, and you get praised to reject your parents. Praised, which means it's okay to do that. Wow. And so this is what toilet paper is imprinting in you. When you know how to use the toilet paper, you can reject your family and you get praised to do that. You know, uh, in some of the work we've done, we found women that say, you know, I, I have two jobs. I work very hard uh, to try to maintain my family. And when I go home at the end of the day, you know, I'm tired. And my kids say, mommy, mommy, mommy. It's like my body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to them. They grab me. And say, so I say, there is one place where I can reject my family without feeling guilty. And this is when I say, Ma, mommy needs to go to the bathroom. You close the door, you lock the door, and now you can sit and enjoy. And that's why you need to have television there. You need a coffee machine. You need to have internet. You need to have a magazine. You need to have... It's amazing what people want to have around the toilet seat at that moment. Because this is a moment where they have the privacy. They can, they, they can be on their own. It, it, it's the first imprint of independence from the family. This is so powerful. And so such an emotion uh, associated with toilet paper, it, it's absolutely amazing. So we, we designed many campaigns uh, about that. I don't know if you remember the, the, the kid taking the, the toilet paper roll and running around the, the, the old house, mm -hmm. uh, followed by the, the roll of paper. So, you know, the, the, this is what is so interesting. And when we recover um, the emotion associated with the first imprint, uh, you have an incredible amount of material that you can use that resonates really resonates with people. That is so interesting. I, and I know the hotel. Was it the Hyatt? The, the Hyatt? Yeah, um, the, the Ritz Carlton. The Ritz Carlton. Yeah, the, the Ritz Carlton. You know, I, I, I was working with Hurt Schutze, the president, a very very good man. I like him very much. And uh, you know, Hurt Schutze. Uh, I told him, you know, uh, this is around the toilet seat that you should invest. Nothing else. Uh, and you say, what is that? Because this is where well, people need to have uh, the coffee machine, the television, the internet, everything, because that's when they really feel like they... Uh... But one thing we did with them, which was very interesting, is when we discovered the first imprint of coffee. And we discovered the first imprint for, that was for Folger Coffee. And uh, the first imprint was Aroma. You know, you imprint coffee for the first time when you are two-year-old. That's what we discovered, taking people back in time, lying down on the floor, uh, and we, they don't have to speak. Uh, they write down what they did remember, so it's anonymous. They don't have to put the name. So we get a lot of information that you will never get in a traditional way. And what we discover is that the first imprint of coffee is when you are two years old. Now, when you are two years old, you don't drink coffee. So what do you imprint? The smell, the aroma. And what does it trigger as an imprint in your mind? Mother is in the kitchen. She is preparing breakfast. She is going to feed me. She loves me. I'm home. I'm safe. This is everything about aroma and coffee. And so I told her, Chusi, put Mr. Coffee in the lobby at the Ritz Carlton. And he said, oh, not everybody drinks coffee. I said, it doesn't matter <laughs> because this is not drinking coffee. It's, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, awakening uh, the, the, all, all the good uh, imp element of the imprint of being home and being safe. I don't know if you remember this commercial that we designed, but it was absolutely brilliant. It's, it's a young guy coming back from the army and he's in a uniform. So we know why. Why? Because this is army, 
outside danger, right? And he's coming home. He's coming home. He's going to be safe. Home is safe. So he arrives home uh, in his uniform, and mother is upstairs asleep. He goes directly to the kitchen, opens the packaging. By the way, we pro- program the packaging. And when you open it, you receive all the aroma in your face. So he, prepared a, he prepares coffee. He doesn't drink coffee. I told them I never see, want to see people drinking this coffee. This is not we're not in the taste business. We are in the aroma business. And so he, he prepared coffee. The aroma goes upstairs. Mothers open an eye. Uh, she smiled, and we know the word she is going to say. Aroma coffee means home safe. She is going to say, "Is home is safe," and she rushed down the stairs, hugged the boy. I mean, we tested it at the time PNG. They used to test everything 400 times. Uh, people were crying. That is crying. Amazing. That is amazing. And I said, "Well, wh- why are you crying? This is your coffee. No, it's not just coffee. It's all that being home and safe and mother and hugging is very reptilian. Touching is very reptilian. So that that was that was something that I don't know when people remember that. Sometimes they still have a little um, tears in their eyes." Well, I got to tell you, Dr. Rapai, when you said that, I hadn't thought about it until now. But what you said is so true. Here's what the deal is with me. I don't drink coffee, but I love the smell of coffee. Now, until you said that, I really didn't connect the dots before. But I remember as a child in Jamaica, and I'm talking very young, my mother, because, you know, Jamaica, Blue Mountain Coffee is supposed to be really, you know, the big thing. And my mom would drink coffee but she would drink the blue mountain instant coffee and when she allowed me to feel that i made her a cup of coffee i would feel so good so important and so grown up that i did this for my mom and i would see her face smile and i until you said that i never made the connection and as to why i love the smell of coffee that yeah. <laughs> is so fascinating but yes the memories the memories that are tied to yeah yeah um, or or yeah. you know bacon you might not eat it but yeah i could look back and see how those are memories of family and bonding and you know all of those yeah. things wow you, you see I, I i call that the the, the culture code uh, glasses the culture code glasses they are glasses that suddenly make you look at things and you see something you didn't see before for example in in all the series you, you see on television you know uh, it could be a ncis or a, a castle or whatever they wear the coffee in the hand you know yeah, it, it's, it's amazing gibbs uh, as always a coffee in his hand and so uh, why coffee? Why, why not a beer or, or water? Or no, no coffee. And and suddenly you realize that there is more than coffee in coffee cup. You know, there there is home, there is safe, there is all this association with, the, you know, the, the uh, a coffee break is more just it's not for people drinking coffee. It's for people reconnecting at another level uh, with the deep emotion of the first imprint. Oh, that is just oh my! I tell you, I could talk to you for hours, but. We are definitely, <laughs> we're definitely winding down. I, of course, you know, I, I have to have you back because there's so many other things to be covered here. And I think to, to, this is allowing people to get an even deeper understanding about choices they've made in, in their lives Absolutely. and what that's connected yeah. with. And, and then could ultimately change the choices they then make moving forward. So Absolutely. this is yeah, what's yeah. great. So, Dr. Rapai, what's your um, website address um, if, you know, for people to look further into your work? Uh, I think it's uh, Archetype Discovery is worldwide. Okay. Uh, yes, I do believe uh, it. Yes. Uh, that, that is dot, one. Dot com. Yes. Archetype Discovery is worldwide. Dot com. Awesome. Well, uh, I think that we are there now on, on wrapping this up. And just any last, just, you know, whatever you'd like to throw out as a, as a tip for something to, to the audience. Yeah, you see, I, I think that we're surrounded by what I call dumb good intention. Uh, dumb good intention is uh, people that have a, a discourse, a, 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 you know, a narrative, uh, that they're going to do uh, good to people. And when 
the result is the opposite. I call that dumb with intention. And, and I think that the way we can select uh, what is really valid and, and useful in, in this good intention is to go back to the first imprint of anything. You know, for example, I'm thinking about the environment, protecting the environment. Uh, but if we, if we don't understand the reptilian, the reptilian, is, the reptilian time is now. Now, not, not in 10 years, 20 years. So when you say to do people to do something and they don't see the consequences now, it's very difficult to change their behavior. Very difficult. You see, uh, so the, 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 this is why we need to be uh, more intelligent in the way we want to uh, protect our environment and get rid of all the plastic bottles that are in the ocean and things like that. But we need to understand that the trigger for people to do something is not giving them some idea that they're going to save the world in 20 years or in 50 years. You know, all these numbers about what is going to be in 2050, 2000, it's irrelevant. Why? Because it's not reptilian. It's all about now. So, but if there is something they can do now and they can see the result now, we have to orient all our action into something that touches the reptilian and make these people being rewarded right now to what you do. You know, you That's cannot train a horse by telling the horse you're going to be rewarded in 10 years. Yes, doesn't work. Well, I definitely... <laughs> no. I definitely thank you so much, Dr. Reply, for taking the time to, uh, to be here with me. And I look forward to chatting with you again very, very soon. Well, It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Uh, thank you. And thanks to our listening audience. And thanks to our engineer, D'Angelo Jones. And of course, as always, um, you can listen to the archive by going to theexpansionzone.com. And to find out more about my work, visit therealsoniabarrett.com. And it, it actually also gets posted on YouTube. So please do subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. And as always, I like channel as well. And as always, I like to remind you to live life to its fullest. <laughs>